Good morning. We're here for the Public Service Commission hearing in docket 203534, application of Rocky Mountain Power for approval of electric vehicle infrastructure program. Um, I just encourage everyone to make sure you stay muted, not speaking, and then, uh, you know, unmute yourself when you need to speak. And we'll start with appearances. So why don't we go to Rocky Mountain Power first? Thank you so much. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Great. Uh, Stephanie Barber on behalf of Rocky Mountain Power. And we have Mr. James Campbell prepared to give testimony today in support of the stipulation. We also have on the line uh, Mr. Robert Meredith, uh, Director of Pricing and Cost of Service, and Professor Reagan Zane, Director of the Aspire Center at Utah State University. They are both available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to the Division of Public Utilities next. Good morning. Patricia E. Schmid with the Attorney General's Office representing the Division of Public Utilities. Our witness in support of the stipulation this morning is David Williams. Also available to answer any questions are Dr. Abdenasser Abdul and Mr. Robert A. Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. I'll go to the Office of Consumer Services next. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? I'm having a little trouble with my camera. We can hear you fine. We can't see you, but we can hear you fine. The Office of Consumer Services, uh, I'm Robert Moore representing the Office of Consumer Services. With me is Alex Ware. He's a utility and analyst from the Office of Consumer Services. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moore. I'll go to the Utah Association of Energy Users next. If we have if we have anybody, they did not file a witness. Okay, it looks like we don't have anyone from UAE participating today. So I'll go to Utah Clean Energy. Good morning, my name is Hunter Holman for Utah Clean Energy and with me today is Thomas Kessinger. He's gonna be providing a brief statement in support of the stipulation and answering any questions, if any. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Holman. I'll go to Western Resource Advocates next. Good morning, Sophie Hayes for Western Resource Advocates and with me today is our witness, Deborah Kapilov, who has a statement in support of the stipulation and is available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. I'll go to Zico Systems doing business as Green Lots next. Good morning. This is Linda Bullen representing uh, Zico Systems Inc. doing business as Green Lots. And with me today is Mr. Thomas Ashley from Green Lots in support of the stipulation as well as available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bullen. I'll go to Charge Point next. Yes, good morning. Scott Dunbar is here on behalf of ChargePoint. I have with me uh, Justin Wilson from ChargePoint, who's also available for to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dunbar. I'll go to EVGO Services next. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Victoria Mandel. I'm a Colorado licensed attorney. I represent EVGO, and with me today, available to make a statement and answer any questions, is Sarah Ravelson with EVGO. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mendel. Is there anyone else who needs to make an appearance? I think I've gone, gotten everybody, but if I've missed you, unmute yourself and let me know now. Okay. Well, with that, we'll go to Rocky Mountain Power for your first witness. Um, may I please the commission? I, I do just have one preliminary matter before I call Mr. Campbell, um, and that is regarding uh, pre-filed testimony. The parties reached an agreement via email exchange last week um, that with the commission's approval that um, it would be appropriate to admit all parties pre-filed testimony in this docket. And so um, at this point in time, I guess I'd like to make a motion to admit all pre-filed testimony in the matter. Okay. So the motion is to admit all the direct rebuttal and sub-rebuttal testimony filed by every party in this docket. 
If anyone objects to that motion, please unmute yourself and indicate your objection. I'm not seeing or hearing any objection to that. So the motion is granted. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, with that, the company calls Mr. James Campbell. Good morning, Mr. Campbell. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Barber. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Campbell. Would you please state and spell your name for the record? Yes, my name is James Campbell. J-A-M-E-S-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. What is your business address? Uh, my address is 1407 West North Temple, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84116. And what is your position with Rocky Mountain Power? I'm the Director of Innovation and Sustainability Policy. And would you please describe your responsibilities in that position as they relate to this docket, the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program? Yes, my responsibilities include evaluating and implementing new and innovative technologies, policies, and programs. I also lead the company's strategic efforts with electric vehicles or EVs. I apologize, I'm getting feedback. Can everybody still hear me okay? Okay. Uh, and have you testified before the commission previously? Yes, I have. And did you file testimony in this matter? Yes, I filed direct and rebuttal testimony in this matter. Okay. And you, you heard that's been admitted. Um, and um, has the company reached an agreement with any of the parties regarding its proposed electric vehicle infrastructure program? Yes, the company reached a uh, settlement agreement with the Division of Public Utilities, the Office of Consumer Services, Western Resource Advocates, Utah Clean Energy, and Zico Systems, Inc., doing business as Green Lots. And who are the parties that did not join the stipulation? Uh, the parties in the docket who did not join the stipulation are ChargePoint, EVgo, and the Utah Association of Energy Users, or UAE. It is my understanding these parties do not oppose the stipulation, though. Okay. And would you please give background information regarding the company's electric vehicle infrastructure program, or EVIP for short? Yes, uh, the company developed the EVIP following the Utah legislature's passage of Utah Code Section 54-4-41, which is titled Recovery of Investment in Utility-Owned Charging Infrastructure. Under the statute, the company is authorized to create an electric vehicle infrastructure program for the deployment of utility-owned charging infrastructure and utility and charging service with a maximum funding of $50 million from customers. In developing the program as required by the statute, the company met with representatives from the Division of Public Utilities, the Office of Consumer Services, the Division of Air Quality, the Department of Transportation, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, the Office of Energy Development, the Board of the Utah Inland Port Authority, the Point of the Mountain State Land Development Authority, Western Resource Advocates, Utah Clean Energy, ChargePoint, and Tesla. Thank you. And what are the statutory requirements for the commission to find that the EVIP is in the public interest? The statute provides that the commission shall find the charging infrastructure program to be in the public interest if the commission finds that the program A increases the availability of electric vehicle battery charging service in the state, B enables the deployment of infrastructure that supports electric vehicle battery charging service and company owned infrastructure in a manner reasonably expected to increase EV adoption, C includes an evaluation of investments in the inland port and the point of the mountain. D, enables competition, innovation, and customer choice and charging service 
while promoting low cost services for electric vehicle battery charging customers. And E provides for ongoing coordination with the Utah Department of Transportation. I believe that the elements of the EVIP as agreed to by the parties in the stipulation satisfy the statutory requirement for being in the public interest. And would you please give an overview of the elements of the EVIP as agreed to by the parties in the settlement stipulation? Yeah, the EVIP includes the following elements. First, the company will invest in company owned charging stations the charging stations will be located in the RMP service territory. The company believes that utility owned charging stations can be deployed in locations across the state to help alleviate range anxiety, in, enhance convenience, and provide needed charging capacity for potential EV purchasers. The company owned charging stations are also expected to add revenue to the system. The rates the company will charge at these charging stations will be provided in the tariff schedule 60 and will be 27 cents per kilowatt hour for existing Rocky Mountain Power customers for DC fast charging, which represents about a 40% discount for RMP customers. And the company will charge 45 cents per kilowatt hour for non RMP customers. For level two charging, company-owned stations will charge $0.08 cents a kilowatt hour. The company will offer a $0.05 cent discount for off-peak charging, and it will charge a $1 session fee. The company will transition the prices for charging at company-owned stations to cost of service starting in year three. At the beginning of the program, revenue generated from company-owned chargers will be allocated 33% to the energy balancing account and 67% to the EVIP balancing account, which I'll discuss a bit more in a minute. The second element of the program will be for make ready investments. Customers may apply to the company for funding for make ready infrastructure investments, which typically include the electrical infrastructure between the utility grid interconnection and the chargers. Applications for make ready investments will be evaluated and approved by the company on a quarterly basis. Third, the company will participate in innovative projects and partnerships. As EV charging technology continues to progress, it will be imperative that the company stay current with the latest advances in vehicle and charging technologies. To do so, the company will participate in studies and projects led by various state and federal agencies and academic institutions. Fourth, the company will continue to offer incentives that are currently offered through Schedule 120 for eligible customers that will cover a portion of the cost of the charging equipment. The company will require smart or networked chargers for a residential customer to receive an incentive. And the company will ensure that incentive recipients are informed about best charging practices. Finally, the EVIP has an education outreach component, which includes the company updating its website to provide information about the impact of different charging behavior on the system and holding a meeting with stakeholders to seek input before finalizing its education plan. The company will fund the EVIP by collecting from customers $5 million per year for 10 years through a new proposed tariff, Schedule 198. Schedule 198 will take effect January 1st, 2022. As the Sustainable Transportation and Energy Plan, also known as STEP, a cost adjust adjustment pilot program comes to an end at the end of this year. The costs of Schedule 198 will be spread to, cu to customer classes as an equal percentage of total base revenue, and the company will establish a balancing account. 
The EVIP balancing account I mentioned previously for revenue and expenses along with a carrying charge. Lastly, as I wrap up this summary of the stipulation, I'd like to highlight the reporting and review processes that were agreed to by the parties during the settlement negotiations. In addition to the statutory reporting requirement to the legislature's Public Utilities, Energy, and Technology Intern Committee, the company will provide annual reports to the commission during the duration of the EVIP. The company will also host annual mid-year stakeholder meetings. Additionally, after the company has been after the pro, excuse me, after the program has been in effect for 3 years and for every 3 years thereafter for the duration of the program, the company will file for a program review with the commission. During the program review, there will be an opportunity to evaluate the prudency of the investments being made recommend changes to tariffs associated with program and adjust the allocation of expenditures among the other issues brought before the commission. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. What is your recommendation to the commission regarding the stipulation? I recommend that the commission approve the stipulation. The stipulation represents the coming together by, by the majority of parties in this docket to reach a compromise agreement regarding the EVIP. The company believes the program, as provided in the stipulation, will increase EV adoption in the state, which will ultimately lead to a reduction in transportation sector emissions. The company believes the program, as agreed to by the parties, is consistent with the statute and the stipulation is just and reasonable in result. The company would ask that the commission approve the stipulation in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, Mr. Campbell is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Barber. Um, I think I'll go forward this way. If any of the parties who joined the STIP or who signed the STIP have any questions for Mr. Campbell, please indicate uh, either unmute yourself or raise your hand in the Google Meet. I'll give just a moment for any of those. So right now I'm asking parties who signed the STIP if you have any questions for Mr. Campbell. I am not seeing or hearing any. Mr. Dunbar, do you have any questions for Mr. Campbell? I do not, thank you. We've waved cross for all witnesses. Thank you. For all, for all witnesses? Yes. Okay, I won't, I won't come back to you individually every time then. Okay. If it, okay, Miss Mandel, do you have any questions for Mr. Campbell? Uh, no, I not. I do not, uh, Chair Chair Lavar. And also, um, the stipulation stated that parties laid all cross. Just to let to let you know. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I won't. I won't come to each of you individually. Then after each witness, I'll just ask generally if anyone has any after all the witnesses. Thank you, Miss Mandel. Uh, Commissioner Allen, I'll go to you next. Do you have any questions for Mr. Campbell? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Clark, do you have any questions for Mr. Campbell? I have no questions. Thank you. And I don't either. So thank you for your testimony this morning, Mr. Campbell. Thank you. James has had a wonderful time. Thank you. Ms. Barber, do you have anything else from Rocky Mountain Power? Nothing else from the company at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Ms. Schmid next for the Division of Public Utilities. Thank you, Chair LeVar. The division will call as its witness, David Williams. May he please be sworn. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Good morning. Please state and spell your name for the record, Mr. Williams. My name is David Williams, D-A-V-I-D. W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. By whom are you employed and what uh, is your job title? I'm employed by the Division of Public Utilities as a utility technical consultant. What is your business address? I believe it is 160 East, 300 South, Salt Lake City, Utah. 
Have you participated on behalf of the division in this docket? I have. Could you please briefly describe your activities? Yes, along with other division witnesses, I reviewed the company's application and accompanying exhibits. I participated in meetings with the company and intervening parties. Uh, we filed data requests to obtain additional information concerning the company's filing, filed testimony, testimony filed by other parties, and participated in settlement negotiations. Thank you. And did you prepare and cause to be filed your direct testimony that has already been admitted in this docket? Yes. Did the division sign the stipulation? Yes. Do you have a statement on behalf of the division in support of the stipulation? Yes, I do. Please proceed. Thank you. Rocky Mountain Power, or the company, submitted its application in this docket on August 23rd of this year. The application sought approval of the company's proposed electric vehicle infrastructure program, which is authorized by Utah statute section 54. 441. Subsection 4 of that statute lists five requirements for a proposed program to be in the public interest. The division filed direct and rebuttal testimony. In the testimony filed in this docket, there were several areas of disagreement. Areas of particular importance to the division included the need for more detailed reporting requirements than were originally proposed, the need for a program review a few years into the program to correct any issues or to make necessary adjustments, the proportion of capital spending assigned to company-owned chargers and to make-ready infrastructure, and the discount rate of DC fast charging given to company customers. On November 17th of this year, the division agreed to a settlement stipulation with the company and with the Office of Consumer Services, Western Resource Advocates, Utah Clean Energy, and Zico Systems doing business as Green Lots, collectively the settling parties. This stipulation was agreed to by the settling parties after several days of arm's length negotiations regarding the issues listed, listed above and other issues. The Utah Association of Energy Users, ChargePoint, and EVGo are parties to this docket but did not enter the stipulation. However, my understanding is that they do not oppose the stipulation. The division believes that overall, the proposed, proposed program as detailed in the settlement stipulation meets the requirement 54441 is just and reasonable in result and is in the public interest. Of particular importance to the division were the following provisions of the stipulation. Paragraph 33, which makes the capital spending roughly equal for company owned chargers and make ready infrastructure incentives, helping to promote competition. Paragraph 34, where the discounted rate for company customers was set at 27 cents per kilowatt rather than the 15 since in the original application. Paragraph 36, which provides that the company chargers will transition to cost of service pricing starting in year three. Paragraph 39, which states that the company will provide an annual report to the commission in a format to be determined later. And paragraph 41, which provides for a program review after three, six, and nine years. The annual report and the program reviews will allow the company to make adjustments to the program and allow parties to review the proposed glide path to cost of service prices for company-owned chargers. The adjusted proportion of capital spending on company-owned chargers versus make-ready infrastructure and the higher discounted rate paid by company customers will enable competition more than the original, originally proposed program. Most parties agree that there is probably not a single true market price for DC fast charging in Utah, 
Rather, the market price is most likely better described as a range. The company proposed a DC fast charging price for non-company users and a separate discounted price for company customers. The prices set forth in the settlement represent a reasonable balance between the statute's requirements of one, allowing a, a discount to company customers and two, enabling competition, particularly when the glide path to cost of service is considered. Taken as a whole, the program proposed in the settlement stipulation represents a reasonable compromise on the contested issues, is just and reasonable in result, and is in the public interest. The division requests that the commission approve the stipulation as filed. This concludes my summary. Thank you. Mr. Williams is now available for questions from the commission and cross-examination. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. If any of the parties have cross-examination for Mr. Williams, please unmute yourself and indicate your desire to ask any questions. And I'll just wait a moment or two to see if anyone does. I'm not seeing or hearing any. Uh, Commissioner Clark, do you have any questions for Mr. Williams? No questions, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Allen, do you have any questions? Also, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. I don't either. So, Mr. Williams, thank you for your testimony. And Ms. Schmidt, do you have anything further from the division? The division has nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Mr. Moore. The office calls Alex Ware and asks that he be sworn. Good morning, Mr. Ware. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Could you please state your name, occupation, and work address for the record? My name is Alex Ware. My address, my office address is 160 East, 300 South, Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'm a utility analyst for the Office of Consumer Services. In your capacity as utility analyst, have you participated in the proceedings in this docket, docket 20035-34? Yes. Did you prepare and file direct testimony on October 19, 2021 and rebuttal testimony on November 4th, 2021, which has been previously admitted in this proceeding? Yes. Have you read and did you participate in the discussions and negotiations leading to the stipulations of the subject of this hearing? Yes, I did. Have you prepared a statement summarizing the OCS's position? Yes. Please proceed. Thank you. I recommend that the commission approve the stipulation under consideration today as being just and reasonable in result and in the public interest. Of particular importance to the OCS are the terms in the stipulation that create a process to establish annual reporting for requirements for the program, as well as in-depth program reviews every three years. Also, the OCS finds it reasonable to include current Schedule 120 incentives as part of the program since there will be a full review, including of Schedule 120 after the third year of the program. Thanks, that concludes my statement. Mr. Ware is available for cross and questions from the commission. Thank you, Mr. Moore. If any party has any cross-examination for Mr. Ware, please unmute yourself and indicate your intention. And I'll just wait a moment or two. I'm not seeing or hearing any cross-examination for Mr. Ware, so I'll go to Commissioner Clark. Do you have any questions for Mr. Ware? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Allen? No questions. Thank you. I don't either. Thank you for your testimony this morning, Mr. Ware. Anything further, Mr. Moore? The office has nothing further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Mr. Holman next. Thank you, Chair LeVar. Utah Clean Energy calls Thomas Kessinger. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Kessinger. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Holman. All right, thank you. Good morning, Mr. K. Good morning. Messenger, record. 
Would you please repeat the question? Can you please state your name and business address for the record? Yes, I can. My name is Thomas Kessinger, and my business address is 1014 Second Ave, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84103. Thank you. And on whose behalf are you testifying today? I am testifying on behalf of Utah Clean Energy. Can you please tell me what your title is with Utah Clean Energy? I am Utah Clean Energy's Beneficial Electrification Program Manager. Thank you, Mr. Kessinger. Recognizing that Utah Clean Energy is a signatory to the settlement stipulation in this case, do you still support the terms of that settlement stipulation today? Yes. And do you have a brief statement for us regarding that settlement stipulation? I do. Please provide that statement. Thank you very much. Utah Clean Energy supports the electric vehicle infrastructure program with the inclusion of the terms outlined in the settlement stipulation. The EVIP is a crucial first step towards the electrification of our transportation sector. This electrification will bring widespread benefits to the majority of Utahns. These benefits include reduced air and noise pollution and tremendous cost savings when compared to owning and operating an internal combustion engine. These ratepayer funded improvements are a significant investment in Utah's energy transition. And I am proud to see Utah join in the many other states rapidly evolving to embrace this coming change. Thank you to all the parties for their expertise and insights. And I look forward to taking what we all learned in this proceeding and applying it to future transportation electrification hearings as the need for this infrastructure grows. There are many facets to the EVIP, but I want to speak briefly about some of the key elements of this proposal and why it is in the public interest. To summarize the public interest objectives or factors in this case, there are five of them. First, increase access to electric vehicle charging, increase EV adoption generally, evaluate the opportunities at the inland port and the point of the mountain. Fourth, enable competition, innovation, and customer choice in electric vehicle battery charging services while promoting low cost services for EV battery charging customers. And five, provide for ongoing consultation with the Utah, Utah Department of Transportation. I'll address each of these in turn. First, the EVIP will increase access to charging infrastructure in three key ways. First, through company-owned chargers. Second, through make-ready infrastructure. And third, by increasing access to at-home charging. Importantly, the availability of make-ready capital to pair with the incoming federal funding from the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act could not have come at a better time. <clears throat> Not only do the make ready funds go further than company owned dollars, but they will likely be able to be matched with some of these federal funds or grants. And in addition, it is imperative that we continue to support home charging, as we know that 80% of charging will take place at home and unlocks the most benefits for consumers and the distribution grid. Second, the EVIP increases EV adoption. The lack of access to charging infrastructure is a well known barrier to EV adoption and this investment will provide many with increased access to charging. And it's important for the company to support EV charging as, <clears throat> excuse me, it's important for the company to, to support EV charging infrastructure and to essentially signify to their customers that this is coming because customers tend to trust their utilities more than other companies. Third, the company has entered into cooperation agreements with the Point of the Mountain and the Inland Port requiring cooperative distribution system planning. And this allows for careful planning for transportation electrification projects. And in addition, the company and, the UDOT, and UDOT have been working closely together and will continue to. Then finally, um, what I, I think has been one of the more contentious areas of this proceeding, however, we have reached an agreement um, at least the parties in the signing the stipulation. Um, the EVIP strikes a balance between enabling competition and offering access to low cost charging. Utah is still in the early days of EV adoption and the EV charging market is underdeveloped in many ways. The EVIP, as I said, strikes a balance by incentivizing adoption of EVs in the near term and incentivizing access to low cost charging, such as home charging and reduced cost DC fast charging. At present, the number of planned company-owned chargers will not leave Utahns without a private charging network in the future. 
And in addition, with access to make-ready funds, charging site hosts will obtain a significant incentive to site a charger. In summary, Utah Clean Energy supports the EVIP with the inclusion of the terms in the settlement stipulation. And thank you again to all the parties in this docket. And I look forward to engaging with the EVIP and future transportation electrification initiatives before the commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kessinger. Chair Levar, uh, Mr. Kessinger is available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Holman. If any party has any questions for Mr. Kessinger, please unmute yourself and indicate that you have questions. I'm not seeing or hearing any. Commissioner Allen, do you have any questions for Mr. Kessinger? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark, do you have any questions? I have no questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, I don't either. So thank you for your testimony this morning. Thank you. Anything else from UCE, Mr. Holman? Nope, that's it for Utah Clean Energy. Thank you, Chair LeVar. Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Good morning. Western Resource Advocates would like to call Deborah Kapilov to the stand and ask that she be sworn. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Ms. Kapilov. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Ms. Kapilov. Will you please state and spell your name for the record? Yes. D-E-B-O-R-A-H-K-A-P-I-L-O-F-F. -F. Would you please uh, give your business address? Yes, 2260 Baseline Road, Suite 200, Boulder, Colorado, 80302. And what is your position with Western Resource Advocates? I am a Transportation Electrification Policy Analyst. Did you file direct rebuttal and sir rebuttal testimony in this docket that was earlier uh, admitted to the record in this proceeding? Yes, I did. And did you participate in the settlement settlement discussions that, that resulted in the, the uh, settlement agreement in this proceeding? Yes. Do you have a statement to provide to the commission today? I do. Go ahead. My name is Deborah Kapiloff and I am speaking on behalf of Western Resource Advocates in support of the stipulation. I find the stipulation to be just and reasonable in result and would like to highlight a few specific provisions which I believe are especially important to ensuring successful program implementation. Firstly, I would like to note that the stipulation includes a provision requiring program review every three years, a practice which is in line with utility transportation electrification plans across the country and helps ensure that funds are deployed effectively to meet program goals. In a field as rapidly changing as transportation electrification, pairing flexibility with oversight is a recipe for ensuring a program that can adapt to changing conditions and meet its goals. I would also like to call attention to the educational and outreach component of the program, which will provide information to customers on how EV charging behavior can affect the grid and encourage customers to shift their flexible load into off-peak hours. Proactive customer education will be especially valuable should a permanent residential time of use rate be established. Additionally, the stipulation provision assigning 45% of the program's capital spend budget to make ready infrastructure will allow for infrastructure deployment to help ease Utah's concerns about range anxiety and a lack of charging infrastructure in the state. Providing utility funded incentives to encourage private capital investment will further the amount of infrastructure built with program funds and encourage charging providers to invest in Utah. As such, the Make Ready infrastructure portion of the program will increase charging availability and foster greater rates of EV adoption. For these reasons, as well as others, I support the stipulation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kapilov is now available for questions. Thank you. If any party has any questions for this witness, please unmute yourself and indicate your questions. I'm not seeing or hearing any. Commissioner Allen, do you have any questions for Ms. Kapiloff? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. I have no questions, thank you. Thank you, I don't either. So thank you for your testimony this morning. Ms. Hayes, do you have anything else from Western Resource Advocates? We have nothing further, thanks. Hey, thank you, Ms. Hayes. I'll go to Ms. Bullen next for Zico Systems. All right, thank you. Uh, we call uh, Mr. Thomas Ashley to the stand. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ashley. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Mr. Ashley, thank you. Please, you. Oh, sorry. State your full name and spell your last name for the record, please. Sure. Thomas Ashley, A S H L E Y. And by whom are you employed and in what capacity? Uh, Zico Systems Inc., uh, DBA Greenlots. I'm Vice President of Policy and Market Development. And what is your business address? 767 South Alameda Street, Suite 200, Los Angeles, California, 90021. And um, in the course of your employment, did you prepare and file direct rebuttal and sir rebuttal testimony that has previously been accepted into evidence in this matter? Yes. Um, and did you also participate in the settlement negotiations in this matter? Yes. Okay. And uh, Greenlot signed that stipulation, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have a brief statement regarding the stipulation that you'd like to give at this time? A brief one, yes. Um, Greenlot supports uh, the stipulation. We appreciate uh, the engagement of, of all parties, both in uh, settlement discussions as well as the proceeding. We look forward to uh, the advancement of the market that the EVIP, uh, including the stipulation, is, is likely to achieve. And uh, we look forward to uh, future engagement with this commission. Thank you. And with that, uh, Mr. Ashley is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bullen. If any party has questions for Mr. Ashley, please unmute yourself and indicate your question. I am not seeing or hearing any. Commissioner Clark, do you have any questions for Mr. Ashley? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. Also no questions, thanks. Thank you, I don't either. So thank you for your testimony this morning, Mr. Ashley. Ms. Bullen, anything else from Zico Systems? We have nothing further at this time. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Mr. Dunbar then for charge point. Thank you, Chair LeVar. Charge point calls Mr. Justin Wilson. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Hey, thank you. Go ahead. Mr. Wilson, would you please state uh, your title and where you are employed? Uh, my title is Director of Public Policy and I'm employed by ChargePoint. And what is your business address? 240 East Hacienda Avenue, Campbell, California, 95008. And did ChargePoint participate in settlement discussions in this proceeding? Yes, we did. And do you have a brief statement regarding ChargePoint's reasons for taking a not opposed position with regard to the settlement? Yes, I do. Please proceed. Um, in this proceeding, ChargePoint uh, took a not opposed position on the settlement. We believe that through settlement negotiations, um, there, were, there was some progress um, made on, from the original filing. Um, in four key areas. Um, first, on the capital spending budget. Um, the settlement um, establishes a 45-45 split between company-owned chargers, make-ready investments, and the innovative projects and partnerships. Allocating equal amounts of funding to company-owned uh, chargers and make-ready will help level the playing field uh, between Rocky Mountain Power owned and operated charging equipment and the competitive market. Um, and create more opportunities for the competitive market to deploy chargers supported by both ratepayer funds and, uh, critically, private investment. Second, uh, the rates of the company-owned chargers. While ChargePoint would have preferred to see the option for site host uh, to have the option to set pricing themselves while being the customer of record, um, the, the prices set in the stipulation are a step in the right direction to be closer to the prices um, in the competitive market. Um, transitioning prices to the cost of service starting in year three is also a step in the right direction. Third, um, establishing the program review process every three years. 
Uh, we believe that this will allow more meaningful opportunity for stakeholders to weigh in on any changes that are necessary to allow and allow time for course correction. And then finally, um, this uh, settlement maintains residential um, and other charger incentives through Schedule 120. Um, Rocky Mountain Power had proposed to end the residential incentives in rebuttal. ChargePoint um, had recommended that those be increased. So keeping the status quo is a good compromise. So, and then there are three reasons why ChargePoint did not join the settlement. Um, first, um, it's still not a level playing field. Uh, while the stipulation makes some improvements, uh, we believe that the value to a side host of allowing Rocky Mountain Power to install company-owned chargers still exceeds the value that customers would be able to receive through make-ready investments. Second, um, site hosts are unable to have choice in the hardware and software they use um, in the company-owned charger program. Utility programs can most effectively enable competition and replicate the competitive markets uh, when there's innovation and customer choice, um, and side hosts have the ability to choose that, that charging equipment and network provider themselves. And then finally, as I, I briefly mentioned earlier, there is no side host choice or control over the, char the prices that drivers will pay. While the prices that um, RMP uh, will charge drivers improved from the application, ChargePoint, again, believes that the competitive market is better supported when um, site hosts are able to set price, and the stipulation does not provide that option. We um, certainly thank all of the parties um, and the company for engaging in the stipulation, and while we um, take a, a not opposed position on this, we do think it is an improvement from um, the original application, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Chair LeVar. Uh, Mr. Wilson is available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. If any party has any questions for Mr. Wilson, please unmute yourself and indicate your questions. I am not seeing or hearing any, so I'll go to Commissioner Allen next. Do you have any questions for Mr. Wilson? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. I have no questions as well, thank you. Thanks, I don't either. So thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Dunbar, anything further from charge points? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Ms. Mandel next. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar, um, and good morning, Ms. Raffleson. Can I see Ms. Raffleson here? There we go. Great. Okay, good. Um, good morning, Ms. Nicholson. Um, could you please state your name and spell uh, your full name and spell your last name? Why, sure. uh, I'm sorry. Why don't I go ahead and swear? Why don't I go ahead and swear her in and then mm -hmm. go to that question? Sorry. Good morning, Ms. Raffleson. Do you swear to tell right. the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Oh, good morning. Um, uh, Ms. Robinson, would you please state your um, full name and spell your last name for the record? Yes. My name is Sarah Raffleson. Raffleson is spelled R-A-F as in Frank, A-L-S-O-N. And Ms. Raffleson, what is your business address? My business address is 11835. West Olympic Avenue, Los Angeles, California, 90064. And what is your position at EVGO? I am Vice President of Market Development and Public Policy. And did you file testimony in this proceeding? Yes. And have you reviewed the stipulation? Yes, I have. And you have a statement for the commissioner's consideration. Yes, I do. Please proceed. Great. As I mentioned, my name is Sarah Raffleson, Vice President of Market Development and Public Policy at EVGO. 
EVgo is the largest provider of public fast charging stations. And so that was the focus uh, for EVgo in this case. We have over 800 locations across the country and we are present in 35 states. We have 15 chargers located in Utah, most of which are in the Salt Lake City area. And EVgo works with automakers such as Nissan and General Motors to expand public charging in key markets with a focus on metro and suburban markets. And right now, we have about 2,000 fast charging stalls under development across the country. EVgo did not um, oppose the stipulation, though we did not sign on for the following reasons. So one, while we appreciate the efforts that parties made um, in regards to encouraging competition, uh, mainly by a, an expansion of the Make Ready program to encourage the third party market. We really did not feel like this went far enough to encourage competition and drive private investment. The reasons for that are as follows. So one, I think we had uh, suggested that there be more of a pause, which would be in alignment with best practices we have seen in other states across the country in regards to the timing by which uh, the utility ownership would begin in the metro areas, which right now have the best, um, most significant private sector business case. So in my testimony, I referenced a couple Western state examples as well as other examples from across the country. But the two that I focused on in, in my testimony were one in Colorado, where the Make Ready program is open in Excel, Colorado, and then would be followed by a uh, stakeholder process and um, uh, siting for the utility-owned stations, um, only to be located in gap areas not being addressed by the private market. So given that the Make Ready program and the utility ownership program are both included in here, because there was that not that pause, we, we did not see that going further and far enough. And the second reason is for the utility owned rate, which we saw as below market, what the private market can charge, including at EVgo's own existing stations as it relates to public DC fast charging. So as such, while EVgo did not oppose the stipulation, we did not see it prudent to sign on and that it did not go far enough as it relates to enabling competition. Thank you very much, Ms. Rapelson. And Ms. Rapelson is now available for questions. Thank you. If any party has any cross-examination questions for Ms. Rapelson, please unmute yourself and indicate your questions. I'm not seeing or hearing any. Uh, Commissioner Allen, do you have any questions for Ms. Rafelson? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Uh, I have no questions. Uh, I would like to thank Ms. Rafelson and all the witnesses who have uh, presented testimony to us today, as well as uh, all who have provided pre-file testimony for their uh, work in this docket and the very helpful uh, views that they provided to us. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. I also don't have any questions for Ms. Rifleson, so thank you for your testimony this morning. Ms. Mandel, do you have anything further from EVgo? No, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anything further from anyone this morning? I'm not seeing or hearing anything. So with that, I will verbally indicate our intention to approve this stipulation and to issue a written order to that effect, likely during the month of December. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.